realize uh, it is a terrible, terrible thing when you take your hands from a place. So, Father, as we meet here this morning, we pray that what is said and done would be to your glory and your honour. Father, we pray that you would take all self out of the equation. But Father, it would just be you that's here. And so, Lord, we bring these things before you. And we pray that we would have open ears and open hearts to receive your word. And again, we just ask these things in thy Son's precious and fearless name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Could you, if possible, maybe the first slide, just... Sorry, I'm going to the next one. Next one. Yeah. This is what we're not going to speak on. <coughs> Um, this is what we're going to speak on, but this is what we're not going to speak on. Um, we're going to look at more of the gifts of the Spirit, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and helpers. Um, but this week, as I was saying to some folk, this week, um, for whatever reason it might be, I just simply get, kept getting the word fire. <laughs> And it wouldn't go away. And yesterday afternoon, um, I got that again, morning afternoon. I got the word fire again. And I knew that it was something that I had to speak on this morning. As I say, it may be for somebody who is listening online, or it might be for somebody in here, who knows. But certainly I can only go by what I have been given. So although we had that prepared, and um, it was up on the screen, then we're not actually going to look at that, but we'll look at that probably in a fortnight's time. And that's me got seven done for a fortnight's four nights time, so it's a boost. Um, but as we know, all this week, um, I'm sure a lot of the kids have been getting excited because today, in one sense, is a special day. And to tell us what day it is today. Fifth of August. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Of course, as we know, really, the subject, if you like, of fire is heavily involved now in Guy Fawkes. And I'm sure I don't need to go through the story of Guy Fawkes, how there was a plot to blow up um, the Houses of Parliament, and of course, that was thwarted and it failed. <coughs> I don't know, I can't remember, I think it's up in Yorkshire, but I'm not 100% sure. But there is a statue with a plaque on it um, in terms of Guy Fawkes. And I seem to recall that there's a verse written on that which I thought was very, very interesting. And it's a verse from John. Job chapter 12, verse 12. And it says this, I'm reading in the King James, but it says, He discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. He discovereth deep things out of darkness. I don't know about you, <coughs> but certainly, me personally, when I have been in a dark place, and it may not be until I come through that dark place, it may be when I'm actually in it, 
that we do discover great truths from Scripture. And when we're in the valley, when we're really, really, really toiling, and we ain't got anywhere else to go, and we turn <coughs> to Christ, we turn to Scripture, that is when we find great truths. In that dark, dark period. And as we know, if you know anything of the story of Job, then you would know that Job went through a horrific, a horrific um, time of it, so he did. But again, he was blessed at the end of it, and we thank God for that. But I really want to try. Um, and take three points in regards to fire. The first one being the fire of destruction. The second one is the fire of purification. And lastly, the fire of presence, of God's presence. So that's the fire of destruction, the fire of purification, and the fire of presence. I may add when I was looking at this, you often wonder, at least I often wonder, um, when you are preparing for a Sunday, if actually what you brought is what you should have, if that makes sense. Um, and boy, did in one sense did I come up against this yesterday. Um, when I started, I couldn't believe some of the things that was happening, and then we came over here to set up. I was messaging Andrea after it. We came over here to set up, and we got set up last night, and I went home. It was, I don't know, about 8 o'clock, half past 8, something like that. And I thought, yeah, that's fine. That gave me an hour, a couple of hours, just to sit and look at this subject this morning. Went into my bag and realised that I'd left my computer over here with the notes on it. But okay, let's just go for it and let's see what happens. So really we are relying totally and utterly on um, the Lord and the Spirit this morning. So it may, it may be a short service, it may be a short service, who knows. Um, but first of all, the fire of destruction. And really when I was thinking about this, um, from the fire really as a judgmental thing, um, we can trace it right back to Genesis, where we see that in Genesis it speaks about Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'm sure you know of, um, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and some of the things that happened in these places was just terrible. The lack of morals, etc. And we could go on and uh, paint a, 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 a quite a, a horrible picture really. But because of the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah, and in actual fact the lack of holiness to be found in that place, <coughs> then we see that God decided to destroy it by fire and brimstone. And then we can come on to Leviticus 10, where two men who were the sons of Aaron, and this really spoke to me actually when I was thinking about it, um, really spoke to me, because these guys offered up an unauthorized, uh, an unauthorized sacrifice before the Lord God. And because it was unauthorized, then we see that God sent a fire from heaven and it was totally and utterly consumed. You see, I think in this, we do see the dangers of bringing 
wrong type of worship? Or we see the dangers in bringing in our own sacrifice to God. What did not happen? You know, we wasn't happy way back there in, in, in Leviticus. And if we wasn't happy in Leviticus, they ain't going to be happy now. That's for sure. So our sacrifices should really be a sweet smelling savory offering to our Lord. I've said this before and I can speak personally or I can only speak personally. But how did I come to church this morning? Was I so busy getting ready and so busy doing this and can I kick it a car no, I'm not joking. Um, but whatever it might be, that actually I forgot the purpose. I forgot the purpose that I was going to church for. Did I prepare myself even before I came into God's presence? Because we're here in God's presence. There is no shadow of doubt about that. And did I prepare myself before I came into God's presence. If we go way back to in the Old Testament again, and we look at, I think it's in Leviticus, certainly if we look at the tent of the meeting, the uh, tabernacle, then you would see these um, <coughs> great high priests, etc., doing a lot of preparation before they went into the holies of the holies. In other words, the inner sanctuary. And of course, as we know, the temple was rented too, so that everybody could enter into God's presence. And I wonder, have we got the same attitude, not a religious attitude as these guys probably have? But have we got that attitude of preparing ourselves, if possible, before we come into God's presence? Aaron's sons didn't do that. And we saw what happened. We could speak a lot more in terms of fire in the, in the um, Old Testament. And one of the one of the things that always stick in my sticks in my mind is when God spoke to Moses through the burning bush. The bush was on fire, so it was, and God spoke to us, so spoke to him through it. And in one of the series, um, AD, I think it's called, um, you see a scene where God is speaking to Moses through the bush, and the bush is burning. You see it in the DVD. And it really does make the hair of your neck stand up. And so, so, so powerful. So God uses fire in many, many different ways. And I suppose if we look at the Old Testament, we could actually say, you know what, that was quite harsh, some of the things that were going. But if we come to Second, second Thessalonians, and I think it's chapter 1, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's chapter 1 where the majority of the chapter is speaking about the judgment of Christ that is coming. And I can assure you, if you thought that it was bad way back then in the Old Testament, then it's going to be a whole lot worse when Christ comes back. A whole lot worse. I'm just going that whole chapter, as I said, is on the judgment, uh, seat, uh, the judgment of Christ when he comes. But I want to break into verse 7 and read to verse 9. Just read for the sake of time you can you can go back and, and look at the whole chapter yourself at home. 
We're standing in the middle of verse 7. It says this, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His might. This is harsh stuff. This is really harsh stuff. And we see that the Lord is going to come back. And he's going to judge those who do not know God. Who do not know God as our own, as Jesus is our own and personal Saviour. But also those, I didn't look at this, but it seems as if there's two different groups of people in one sense here. Um, it says about those who do not know God, and then it goes on to say, and on those who do not obey the gospel. <clears throat> and then, <coughs> we'll come back to that. But then 2 Peter 3 and 10, <clears throat> it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat, and the air and the works that therein shall be burned up. So really, <clears throat> if we look at the reading in Thessalonians, then it's speaking about humanity. It's speaking about individuals. It's speaking about people. Those who do not know God, and those who are not obedient to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure, like me, and those who are listening online, I'm sure you know as well, what the gospel of Jesus Christ actually is. Part of that gospel, the most important part of that gospel, is to recognize that we are sinners, recognize that we need to be saved, that we need to be born again, and we need to be redeemed by Christ Himself. If we don't do that, quite clear warning, then basically we're loose. Because it tells us there. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. No just a wee thing. No just for two, three, ten years. For eternal destruction. That's frightening. It's frightening for me. I don't know about you. I certainly wouldn't have liked to be in these folks' shoes. Because at this point it's too late, there ain't no coming back. There ain't no coming back. That is why we need to make sure that we're ready. Vicky and um, Franz and Ava are coming um, back for a holiday in January. And I was on the face time to Victoria. And she is already looking at getting her tickets. Why? She wants to make sure she's ready. She just doesn't want to turn up at the airport on the 7th or, or uh, on the 1st or the 2nd of January and just thought, you know what, I might get a flight, I might. I'll just take that chance. If I get a ticket, to do if I don't. No, she's already getting prepared. 
and we need to be prepared. Because it says there in this passage as well, if we read it in Peter, that he's going to come as a thief in the night. We might try and figure it out, and there's a lot of people sadly who have tried to figure out when Christ is coming back. I'm sorry, they don't know. It's a bottom line. There is only one person who knows when Jesus is, Jesus is coming back, and that is God himself. He tells us that in Scripture. So there is no point in us even trying to figure it out. Who we should be more interested in is getting prepared. Because it could come before this day's out, in one sense. We need to make sure that we are prepared for the Lord's return. But that's speaking about humanity. That's speaking about individuals. But then we come to the passage in 2 Peter. Where it says, The heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You know what? <clears throat> I may mean, say that's very wrong, but the works are just temporal things. The works will never, ever get us. To heaven. It's good to do good, good works. It's good to establish good organizations. It's good to be involved in great programs, etc. But this verse tells us that if we burn up, if we go on, we disappear forever. The heavens will be passed away. The elements shall be dissolved and the earth and the works that are in shall be burned up. I don't know, I was sharing this at, uh, I was sharing this at Bible study, I think. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, in this in regards to this passage, but there is a lot of talk at the moment about global warming. The earth's heating up. With fervent heat, and the works therein shall be burned up. Just something to ponder. Just something to ponder. But anyway, it'll be a sad, sad time. And as I say, we know that um, he's going to come back as a thief in the night. I'm sure, like me, with, is with great sadness actually, that you witnessed a lot of the storms that's happened over the past few weeks. Horrendous, horrendous destruction. Um, people were warned about these storms coming. Um, there was yellow warnings and red warnings, and so the list um, went on. They were getting prepared for that storm. And as I said earlier, this book that we've got, this Bible, gives us a warning, if you want, for a storm that's going to come. Going to come in the future. And there is no diverting that storm. There is no getting away from that storm. It's going to hit the full force. The only thing we can do is be ready. And we need to make sure we're ready. And then we come very briefly, because I've spoken in this before, <clears throat> but we come to our second point, which is the fire of purification. And when I was thinking about this, my mind went to a passage, if I'll be honest, passage in scripture that I've not delved a lot into really, but in Zechariah 13 and verse 9. And it says there, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. 
I will turn my hand against the little ones and the whole land, declares the Lord. Two thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I really don't like it when times of trial come. I really don't like it when I'm being tested. And one of the reasons, and I think you would agree with me here, is one of the reasons I don't like it is because it hurts. Sometimes it can be really old. Sometimes it can be really sore. If we go near a fire, then we realize that the closer we get, the warmer it gets. And if we have to touch it, it would be burning, which would be really sore. But you know, God puts us through difficult times. And the reason that he puts us through difficult times is possibly to test our faith, but to refine us, to purify us, to sanctify us. And we do come through the other side. And once we come through the other side, then, if you like, we're a better quality than when we went in. I remember seeing a, I remember seeing a program in the television about them refining um, silver. And it was quite fascinating just to sit and watch because you could physically see all the wee imperfect imperfections all the wee black spots, if you like, just dissolving or being burned up. And all we were left with was this pure, pure silver. And that's the picture that God is doing with us. I it may be sore. I it may be over. I it may be a pain. But he's purifying us as silver and gold. So that after that process, we will be a better person than we were before. And in actual fact, if you have seen a lot of people who, I don't know um, if I've said this before, but I was watching one of the, the antique program things on the television. It was on when I was studying, um, <clears throat> and I was just kind of uh, glancing at it, and I wasn't really able to pay much attention. I'm telling a lie, it wasn't an antiques program at all. I think it was, uh, I was going to say the shed. The repair shop? The repair shop. I think it was the repair shop. And this lady brought in. A mirror, I think it was a mirror of stained glass window, something like that, I think maybe in a, it wasn't a mirror, but it was something like that. And she explained the history behind it. And it was her great grannies, and she had got it through that, and uh, she had abused it, and it had a few cracks in it, and it didn't look very nice, etc., etc. You could see where the cracks were, and um, quite a number of them. And she was basically saying to these guys, did you do anything with them? And they said, well, we'll see, I'm not sure. And she went on to say, I've seen a Japanese art. And what they do in Japan, if, if they get a broken vase, then they join the vase with gold. And that vase is softy, it's made gold. But it's actually worth more after it was broken than it was when it was first made. So the repair shop guys got to work and they did, they managed to 
and the lady open up and then the lady could go and crack and it was beautiful afterwards. I would go as far as to say there was more beauty in it after than before. You know, we might have scars, we might have cracks in our life, but what God does, He embraces it with gold if you like. And because of those scars, then we realize that yes, we have been through that fire. Yes, we have been purified. And yes, because of those scars, when we come through the other side, then we're more valuable than we were at the beginning. And God sees the value in that. And can I just, supposing that you forget everything else I've said today, can you remember this one thing? That you're more valuable now, after all you've been through, than you were before. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. To see the worth of the individual. And for you to see your own worth, actually, to be honest. Sometimes if you're like me, you'll put yourself down. And you'll say, you know, if I could just do this, or if I could just do that, or if I could just do the next thing. And God's saying, look, you're doing pretty good. And I shall sure like what you're doing and what you're doing is okay. We need to really sometimes concentrate on our own self work. Because in the eyes of Jesus, in the eyes of God, then you are precious. So, so precious. So precious that he went and put his son on a cross to die for me. That's how precious you be there. And then we come lastly, and I'll be quick with this, but <clears throat> we come to the fire of divine presence. And if we go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9, we'll just take time to read this um, wee section. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation already, to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, Though for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testy genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes through it is tested by fire, may be found to be a result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though that you do not see him, you believe in him, and rejoice with joy, that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith and the salvation of your souls. You know, when I was thinking about that passage, that last section there really struck, struck me. Though you have not seen him, you love him. 
Physically, we have never seen Jesus. Physically, we've never seen him. And yet, we love him. And we don't see him now. But you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Are you happy this morning? Because you believe in Jesus? Are you filled and rejoice with great joy? That I we may not be able to see him. We may just be able to read to the uh, read about him. We may feel his presence from time to time. But praise God you believe in him. Praise God you ask him into your life. And that in itself should create great joy in our hearts. Who oh, is it the old, the old chorus uh, went like, um, I've got joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Yeah. Down in my heart. I've got it, 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 it. And so <laughs> and you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of truths in that one sense, isn't it? We should have that joy, joy down in our heart, at the deepest part of our lives. Why? Because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then Hebrews 12, 28 29. Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. The section prior to this is speaking, well this whole section actually, is speaking about believers. Certainly from verse 18 onwards, we see a reference to two different kinds of covenants the Old and the New Covenant, and if we had to read through the chapter, then we would realise that the chapter doesn't actually say what kind of mountain or name the mountain, but what it does say is just a mountain. But we're led to believe if we look at commentaries and <coughs> different books, they were led to believe that this is Mount Sinai. And if you know anything about Mount Sinai, then you would realise those terrible things happen there. And then, from verse 22 to 24, we see that it speaks about the New Covenant, or it speaks about the New Covenant as well, rather. And it speaks about a different mountain. This time it speaks about Mount Zion, a dwelling place of God. And if we do a compare and contrast thing here, then we realise that Mount Sinai has seven references to fear and terror. Let me run through them. First of all, it says a mountain that cannot be touched. Then we see that it's burning with fire. Then we see there's darkness there. We see there's gloom there. We see there's a storm there. We see a trumpet blasts there as well. And of course, we hear that there's, we read that there's a voice speaking of words. But then we come to the New Covenant. <coughs> and the New Covenant is something totally and utterly different. Because we don't see seven horrible things, but we see seven beautiful things. And I could test Stevie at this point because I'm sure he was looking at the number seven in the scriptures. So I'm sure he can tell us what the number seven means. But anyway, seven beautiful things we read about Mount Zion. 
thousand, sorry, the heavenly Jerusalem is the city of a living God, Mount Zion, the city of Jerusalem is the city of the living God. And then number two, thousand upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. <clears throat> Wouldn't that be amazing to hear that sort of choir? Thousand upon thousand of angels singing. Then number three, the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You know, if you're a believer, then we can guarantee that your name will be written in heaven. And when that book is open, then we will be down the list and there will be John Smith. Ah, it's okay. You can come in. Your name is written in the book in heaven. <clears throat> and of course we see the God and judge of all people. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And lastly, the sprinkled blood that speaks a better blood <coughs> than the blood of Abel. That blood that was shed for you and for me. But when we look at this, when we look at this in verse in Hebrews 12, or a couple of verses in Hebrews 12, we see that the words in Greek, therefore, a kingdom unshaken. A kingdom that just can't be I wonder how is your world? How is your life today? Is it sometimes, is it like mine, experiencing various minor and major tremors, whether emotionally or physically? Is that what your world is like today? For all experience, varying degrees of difficulties and tribulations. But you know, these words should be tattooed across a forehead. Therefore, a kingdom that is unshakable. And guess what? You are part of that kingdom that cannot be moved. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, though many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. And when we enter, we will be there forever unshaken. Isn't that amazing? My mind goes back to that old hymn that I forgot. <laughs> Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And you know that was written, somebody hiding in a cave. But it was a great storm raging. But they were safe. They were safe in that cave, in that rock, in that mountain, because it was unshakable. And you know, you may have been through a really, really difficult time. But can I reassure you that you are part of that unshakable kingdom? That kingdom that just cannot be moved. You 
know, when I was thinking <coughs> about this, I was asking myself a question. Where does my focus lie? Does my focus lie on temporal things? Does my focus lie on worldly things? You know, we, we can read about the seven wonders of the world, whether they are the tomb of Masosis that was built in 350 BC, or the temple of Artemis in Ephesus, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and so it goes on. You know, these bar the pyramids of Egypt have been wrecked, have been destroyed. They were just, yeah, they, they may have been a wonder of the world. But they're only temporary. They're only temporary. And you know, we're told that the temporary things will pass away. They'll be burned up. They'll be gone forever. But what's going to last is your faith. What's going to be solid is that unshakable kingdom. Yes, even the heavens and the air might pass away. But God's kingdom will never pass away. And you are part of that. Just to finish up, I'm sure like me you have seen many wildfires um, reported about in the television where a fire comes through a community and envelops that whole community, destroys the whole community. Everybody's property is gone and it's a sad, sad thing to see. But at the end there, what does it say? God is an all-consuming God. God is an all-consuming fire. <coughs> you know, when I thought about that, and I thought about a fire consuming a whole village, God's love totally and utterly consumes you. It covers and fills every <coughs> every single part of your being. His love is like a consuming fire that envelops your whole being. So much so, I says earlier on, didn't I, that he was willing to give his all for you and for me. And that was his one and only son. So much is his love. And we can just pass in one sense in that love. We can feel comforted in that love. And finally, I think it's fair to say that we can feel secure in that love. The love that drew salvation. We are part of that unshakable kingdom. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with our final hymn, which is... I heard that, Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> it's frozen.